Bible reads, verse number 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. This verse here is saying, you know, there's some people out there that don't know God. There's a lot of people out there that don't have the knowledge of God. And as he's writing to the Corinthians, as he's writing to this church at Corinth, he's saying, I speak this to your shame. It's your shame that there's people out there that don't know God. There's people out there that don't have the knowledge of God. Shame on you for not going out and teaching these people about God. Unfortunately, there's too many churches today that are not going out and reaching their community, not going out and reaching people with the gospel of Christ. What a shame it is for someone to, to die in their sins, to go to hell, and have never heard the gospel one time in their life. What a shame that would be. They say, I never really had an opportunity. I never really, no one ever really explained it to me. Well, shame on you if that's, if that's the case, if that's something that happens to your neighbor or someone that you know. And that's what the Apostle Paul is writing to these people. Hey, some people don't know God. Shame on you. That's a shame. And I believe it's a shame today for believers, for Christians, to not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is something that is given to every believer. This is the duty, the responsibility of every person who is born again to preach the gospel to every creature. And it's a shame unto us if we don't do that. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, just a few pages backwards. 1 Earlier in this epistle, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in verse number 16 of 1 Corinthians 9. For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's saying it's a necessity. I must preach the gospel. And in fact, woe unto me if I don't go out and preach the gospel. And he's saying, look, this is the way that God made it. I am obligated to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That is my duty. That is my responsibility. It is a necessity. And actually, if I don't do it, woe unto me. And then he explains, well, you know, if I do this thing willingly, God's going to reward me. You know, if we just say, yeah, Lord, here I am, send me. I'll go out. I'll preach the gospel to the lost. Hey, God's going to reward you for that. That's great. It's a, it's a bonus there. He said, hey, not only is it a necessity, but God's going to take care of you. He's going to reward you. You're going to earn rewards in heaven. But if you don't do it, it's woe unto me. It's, it's a shame. It's displeasing unto the Lord. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to prove this to you this morning that it is our duty. It's not just the Apostle Paul. You say, well, Apostle Paul was a missionary. Apostle Paul was an evangelist. That was his job. That's something that he needs to go out and do. That was something for him, but you don't understand. I, I, I'm shy. You don't understand. I'm not, I don't know how to talk to people. You don't understand. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm not good at this. So I, those people could go out and do that. Yeah, God sent him out to do it. No, God sent all of us to do that. It's not just the Apostle Paul. You're in 2 Corinthians now, chapter number 5. Look at verse number 9. We're going to see a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ. We have to understand that there's two judgment seats. There's the great white throne judgment at the end of everything, after the millennium, after everything, right near the end of Revelation, you see the great white throne judgment where death and hell deliver up the dead that are in them, the sea delivers up the dead that are in them, and the people who are not saved are judged by their works, and they're cast into the lake of fire. That's the great white throne judgment. We don't have to worry about that one. But there's a judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is something here we're going to read about. Look at verse number 9, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor, means we work, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we know, you know, if, you, if you're saved, you have eternal life, you're always saved. You're not going to lose your salvation. God's not going to, at the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to be sending people to hell. Christ has paid for all of your sins. Praise the Lord for that. And we'll see that here in just a few minutes that he says um, that we're saved 
No, actually, that's in the, that's in the other chapter. But um, yet so is by fire. We're saved. But um, I want to point out here that it says here we labor that we may be accepted of him. Not accepted in the sense of our salvation, but accepted in the sense that if my, my, what my son is very, very young right now. I'm going to teach him and train him and love him. I'm always going to love my child. I'm always going to love my son. That's never going to end. That's never going to stop. The same way that God loves his children, those who are born again, those who become a son of God, have eternal life. But if he lives a way that is wicked, if he lives a way where, where he's not following the way I taught him, he's not listening to me, he wants nothing to do with me, he's real rebellious, he's not going to be accepted by me. Now, he's going to be my son, and I'm going to love him. I'm going to care for him, of course. But he's not going to be living an acceptable life to me. And as God's children, we want to be accepted of our Father. We want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want him to say, good job, son. Right. We want to be accepted of him. That's what it's talking about here. And he's saying, look, we all have to appear before the judgment of Christ. No one's getting out of this. Everybody's going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. The works that you do. See, this is where works come into play. It has nothing to do with you being saved, but the works that you do have everything to do with your rewards in heaven. It has everything to do with what you're going to receive at the judgment seat of Christ. It says, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We know the terror of the Lord. We go out and we persuade men. We need to persuade people to get saved. Sometimes Not everyone's just falling over themselves to get saved. Sometimes that's the case, but sometimes it takes a lot of persuasion. You need to, to convince people that the Bible's true. You need to convince people that they're sinners. You need to convince people that they deserve a judgment of hell because most people don't think they're that bad. Most people think that, well, you know, I'm going to heaven because it's not like I've killed anybody. It's not like I've raped anybody. And that's what they think. We need to convince them that, no, in God's eyes, you deserve hell. You may not have done any of those things. And praise God that you didn't do those things, but you still deserve hell and you need a Savior. Amen. And we need to persuade people to get saved. Verse number 12, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in the heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He's saying... You know, the fact that Christ died for everybody, he died for your sins, you shouldn't then just go and live for yourself. That is not the Christian life at all. Me, 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 well, I'm just going to go, I don't want to go out and preach the gospel because I've got other things to do. I've got, I want to watch this TV show. I want to go do this. I want to go do that. We don't live for ourselves. Jesus Christ gave us the example. He never lived for himself. He lived for everyone else all the time. He was the one that was homeless. He was the one that was walking around, going, traveling from town to town and preaching the word of God. Preaching, healing, and, and doing the ministry that God gave him to do. And not once was he ever worried about himself. He would stay up all night. He would stay up in prayer. He cared about his disciples. He cared about the lost. He cared about you and me to do everything necessary to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ gave us that example. We should not henceforth live unto ourselves. And it's very selfish if you want to say, I don't want to go out and preach the gospel to someone else because I've got other things that I have to do. Now look, I understand when things come up from time to time, but if that's just your regular attitude and your regular thing, well, I just can't do this because I've got too many other things going on, then shame on you. Verse number 16, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given, to, don't miss this, and hath given to us, verse 18, and hath given to us 
The ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? It's when you're reconciling people. And we're going to see that here in the next verse. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus Christ came to reconcile the world unto himself. That was his goal. That was his job. He came to reconcile the world. Why? Because we were at odds with God. Why? Because our sin has, has separated us from the love of God. Our sin has, has come in and killed our spirit. And Jesus Christ came to reconcile us, to make things right, to bring us back to God, to bring us back in a good standing with God. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The second time there, verse 18, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When Christ was in this world, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. But guess what? Christ died on that cross and rose again from the dead. He's no longer walking around on this earth as he did for those 33 years. He's not here anymore physically walking around and preaching the gospel. That's why he's given us that ministry. It's our job. He's saying, look, we're ambassadors. What is an ambassador? They represent somebody else. That's what an ambassador is. That's what an ambassador is in politics. You send somebody over to a foreign country that's representing the interests of your country. Jesus Christ has made us ambassadors for him because he's not here. We need to do a job while he's gone. Well, he's up in heaven. We have the job of preaching the gospel to every creature. It's committed unto us, this ministry. Ministry means you're doing something for someone else. We're not living for ourselves. We're esteeming others better than ourselves. We're doing this work, and we are representing God. We represent Jesus Christ. When we go out to the door, we say, do you know for sure if you die today that you'd be going to heaven? Can I show you what it takes to be saved? Can I show you that God loves you? Can I show you what the Bible says and how you can have eternal life? We're representing God. We're representing Jesus Christ. This is our mission. This is our job. And look, an ambassador is a pretty high-standing job. In the world today, it's a very well-paying job. It's something that you, you need to be faithful in order to get that job. You need to be someone that's reliable. You need to be someone dependable to be an ambassador. If you're going to entrust someone else, I mean, think about this for yourself. If you want someone else to go out and represent you and what you believe and what you think, you're not going to just choose anybody. You're going to want someone who's going to accurately represent what you want, someone that knows you. Someone that knows what you want. Someone, someone that's able to represent you and you could rely on them. Now look, God has already given us this job. We didn't apply for it. It's already given to us. He's saying, you have this job. We ought to live up to the high standards of the calling of being an ambassador for Christ. Let's make sure we know who God is so we can represent him accurately. Let's go out and actually do the work that he's given us to do and, and really represent him. Tell people about him. Let's not have it be a shame that there's some that have not the knowledge of God in our area, in our town, where we live. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a shame unto God. And I don't think you do either, otherwise you wouldn't be here this morning. Especially in a church like this. You're like, I didn't come here for this. I came here to you to tell me how great I am so I can leave happy and just come back next week. That's not where we're here. So if you're visiting for the first time, welcome to Word of Truth Baptist Church. We hope you do come back. <laughs> Turn if you went to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> also, what we notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that, you know, we're a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. We're a new creature. We're a new man. We have a new spirit that's born inside of us that's going to lead us and guide us into all truth and wisdom. Ephesians chapter 2, of course, verses 8 and 9 are real famous verses that we love to use out soul winning. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. But look at verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation's free, praise the Lord. Hey, I don't have to work for it. It's a free gift. I just have to receive it. But that's not why, you know, God didn't just create us and make us so that you could sit around and do nothing. He says, I'm giving it to you for free. You've got everything that you need, but you're created under good works. You need to do something with it, man. I've saved your soul. Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I've given you a new creature. What are you going to do? Everyone that's saved is a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. We have the same spirit. Every single one of us, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. We have that same spirit. Unfortunately, the desire that the Spirit gives us, because the Spirit gives us a prompting. The Spirit will give you the, 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 the prompting to go and preach the gospel to people and to make the right choices. That's what the Spirit is, is there. It helps to comfort us and provide us um, direction and guidance. But unfortunately, the desire that the Spirit gives us to tell others about salvation too often is satisfied in the minds of many people by simply handing out a piece of paper. By simply handing out a gospel tract. By simply maybe giving them a Bible. That is not the job that we are called to do. Nowhere in Scripture will you find Jesus or the disciples handing out a piece of paper. You will not find that in Scripture. Now, do we have gospel tracts? Yes, we do. Am I just 100% against using gospel tracts? No, I'm not. But that's not the job that we're called to do. Look, if you want to add that and, 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 and you know, doing your best, giving everything that you possibly can to help somebody get saved, great. Praise the Lord. I'm for that. But if you think that that satisfies the requirement of being an ambassador and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when I was, when I was preparing for this sermon, I decided against doing it because it, there's, there's so many verses. I think there's over 70 verses that say, preach the gospel. In the New Testament, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. What does it mean to preach? Does preach mean hand out a piece of paper? Because I don't think that's the definition of preach. I think when you preach, you're using your mouth. I think when you preach, you're opening up your mouth boldly to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what preaching is. We are not called to give people reading material. We're called to preach the gospel. And over, that's what you're going to find in the Bible. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature over and over again. Turn, if you would, to... Um, well, I'll, I'll read this for you. Turn, if you would, to Jude. The book of Jude, all the way near the end of the Bible. In Ezekiel, we've got two chapters that talk about being a watchman. And I'm going to read for you from Ezekiel chapter number 3. Again, this is a job that is given unto us. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ. We're called to, we have the ministry of reconciliation. We need to reconcile people to God because Christ isn't here to do it himself. He's given us that ministry. Ezekiel chapter 3, I'll just read this for you. You can follow along if you want, but I'm going to read for you from Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Now, again, you can say, Oh, that's the Old Testament. He's talking to the house of Israel. Okay, I get that. But this is completely applicable for us today. We don't look at the Old Testament and say, oh, well, there's all just for the house of Israel. It's all just for the Jews, so we don't need to look at any of this stuff. That's not how we look at Scripture. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to prove that actually tonight. On uh, 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 One of the points of my sermon tonight, I'm going to show you that, no, it does apply to us. And exactly why, it, it, you know, we are the children of God, just as the children of Israel were considered His children. Okay, it applies to us today, but I'm going to keep reading here. I've made thee a watchman in the house of Israel, therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So what he's saying here is, when God gives the warning, and he says the wicked man is going to die, they're going to perish. 
And he's telling this watchman that. If the watchman doesn't say anything to the wicked person that, hey, God's going to destroy you. You know, you're living wickedly. If you don't change your ways, God's going to come and destroy you. That wicked person's still going to die. They're still going to die in their sins because God's going to do it. He says, but if you don't warn them, I'm going to require their blood at your hands. Because you didn't go and tell them. You didn't at least give them a warning. You didn't even at least give them a chance. I'm going to keep reading here. Verse number 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. He says, well, at least if you tell them, and they decide not to do anything about it, well, yeah, then they're still going to be destroyed. But you've at least done your job as a watchman. Verse number 20, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul." God wants us to warn people. It's our job to warn people. There's a judgment to come. There's a point on the man wants to die, but after there's a judgment. Okay, there's a judgment that comes after we die. And people need to understand this and know this. And look, sometimes people aren't receptive at all. People don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Christ. But you know what? We at least got to warn them and say, okay, that's your choice. But guess what? You know, here's the truth. The Bible says that if you don't put your faith in Christ, you're going to hell when you die. And I understand people might say, well, that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. I get it. But it's our job. Right. The Christian life, and many of you may not know this, but the Christian life is not one of comfort. It is not one where we just have servants bring us everything that we want. And God's going to give us a million dollars and everything's just going to be great and, and roses and rainbows. Okay? That's not, that's not the Christian life. The Bible says, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If, you live, if you're doing what's right, you're going to be attacked for it. If you're standing on the truth in God's word, look, look at what they did to Jesus Christ. They nailed him to a cross. The world isn't that much different today than it was back then. There are still plenty of people that hate the word of God. But look, that's not our problem. That God didn't say, well, preach the gospel unless they say mean things to you. He didn't say preach the gospel unless, you know, you don't feel like doing it. No. Preach the gospel to every creature. It may make you uncomfortable. It's not the easiest thing to say, but we need to learn how to do it. Because here's the thing. If you really love somebody, you're going to tell them where they're headed. If you care about it, you cannot tell me that you care about someone if you're not willing to tell them that they're going to hell if they don't have Christ as their Savior. You don't care about them at all. Because if you know the reality, if you know the fact that hell is a real place and that people are dying to go there, if you don't have Christ as your Savior, you're going to be there too. If you know that, you're saved. You put your faith in Christ. You're a new creature. You've received that free gift. But you're not willing to tell other people where they're headed. You hate that person. You might as well be damning them to hell. And let that sink in. Think about this idea of a watchman. I read for you in Ezekiel chapter 3, a watchman is supposed to be standing up on the towers of a city, looking out for the enemy, right? And supposed to sound the alarm when they see the attack coming, when they see people coming to destroy. That's what a watchman does. How good of a watchman would he be if he just saw the enemy coming and then ran around real quick and just put a little flyer in everybody's door? That's all he did, right? Didn't even knock, just go. <laughs> well, I gave him their warning. Is that really a good warning? And if you saw destruction coming, is that what you would choose to do is, is to get people ready, to get people you know, aware of what's going to happen? That's not what I would do. Or if you saw somebody's house on fire, your neighbor's house just burning to the ground, and you know that they're inside of there, you'd be going, hey, wake up, man! Destruction's coming! Get out of there! 
we need to treat this serious. Now look, we're dealing with the unseen right now, but we believe it on faith. We know that hell is real. But it's, it's, it's no less real than the neighbor's house that's burning down that they need to get out of, that they need to be saved from. That's easy to see because you can physically see with your eyes and you need to act right away. We need to have the same sense of urgency for souls today because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know whether your, your, your family member, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your neighbor is going to see another day. And when you know that they're without Christ, we need the urgency to warn them. At the very least, warn them. That's our job. You can't make people believe. You can't make people get saved. It's their choice. But if they choose to stay in the burning house, you, if you've warned them, you, at least you've done your job. And you could rest easy at night knowing, God, I, I, I did my job. And I did it to the best of my ability. <clears throat> You're in Jude. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Again, this is the job for us to do. There's different ways you can approach people about the gospel. People respond differently to, to, to different approaches, different forms of persuasion. You're saying, you know what, some people, you have compassion on them, you make a difference, and they respond to that. But, I mean, either way, they need to hear the gospel. Okay, everyone needs to hear the gospel. But others, it says, save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. You say, I don't like the confrontational soul winning. How else are you going to save them with fear if you don't tell them about the, about the judgment that's coming? It may not be pleasant, but it's necessary. Look, it's not pleasant for me to spank my children. It's not. I don't like doing it. It's not like I just really, hey, it's cool, it's time to spank them again. No, not at all. But it's necessary if I want them to turn upright. I mean, the Bible says not to spare the rod. That if I spare the rod, that I hate my, child, my son. I mean, that's what the book says. That's what the Bible says. Read the book of Proverbs. It'll become crystal clear how we're supposed to discipline our children. Look, you do things sometimes that you don't like because it's necessary, because it's needful. And I'll say this right now. For any of you who after listening, we're not even done with the sermon yet. You want to come out soul winning. Look, we make it easy on you here. We're not just going to throw you out there. You've never done it before and just expect you to figure it out. Okay, we've got a lot of soul winning times. We've got a special one coming up on Saturday. You come out with us. We'll pair you up with someone else who's already gone out, who knows what they're doing, and who, 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 who knows the gospel really well and can explain it to people, and you just go along for the ride. You'd be a silent partner, and you could learn, and you can see what they do. You could see, oh, here's the verses they do, and then eventually you could start talking too and, and just explaining the gospel too. Look, and, and I'm not saying you have to do that. Look, no one has to do that. If you're saved today, you know how you got saved. You need to tell other people how you got saved. And be sure you use the word of God. We'll get to that in a, in a, at the end of the sermon here. Turn if you want to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Lost souls, lost souls are headed to hell every day. Every single day. Does that matter to you? How much does that matter to you? <clears throat> How zealously do you think we should warn them? Say, so you fundamental Baptists are nuts. It's like you're in a cult. I've been told that before many times. When I actually got right with God, started going to a good church that was on fire. And wow, oh, man, what do you mean? You know, you don't do this anymore. You don't do that anymore. You know, what, what's the big deal? What, what, what's the problem, man? Well, it's because I love God and I want to be used by Him. And I actually want to treat what He says seriously. I don't want to be flippant about it. I don't want to just allow and be real permissive and just allow everything in my life like I don't care what God says. I care what He says. And not only is it with the sin, it's with, it's with the other things he told us to do. Not just the sins of commission where we commit a sin and we, and we break one of God's rules. It's the, when we sin, the sins that we don't do something he told us to do. Like reconciling people to God. <clears throat> don't think that you've got it all together because you're living a pretty clean life if you're not going out and winning souls of Christ. You've got, you got a big problem in your spiritual life if that's the case. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, we work together with God. Without God, we're nothing. You want to go out and preach the gospel, if you don't have God with you, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything. That's why say unsaved people can't win people to Christ. Because they don't have God in them. They don't have, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They, don't, they can't do it. But I'll tell you what, God's not doing anything without us either as far as souls getting saved. God's not appearing to people and giving them the gospel and giving them that opportunity to get saved. He's given us that ministry of reconciliation. That's why it's so important. We need to get together in the yoke with Jesus. We, we need to team up and do the work with him. Obviously, God gets all the honor and the glory and the credit for our salvation because he did everything for us. Right. Of course. But he still is relying on us to make sure that people hear the gospel so they could get saved. I don't believe this. You know, people bring up these arguments before. Well, what about the person who's in Africa? He's always, always some tribe in Africa. And... They just call out on whatever they think is God and they're sincere in their heart. Is that person going to heaven? No. No. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay? And there's no name under heaven whereby one must be saved except Jesus Christ. It, he, that is where our salvation lies of what he did for us. People need to hear. And that's why it's so important. See, people don't want to hear that. They want to think that people can still be saved because they're sincere in their heart. Because you know what that does? That alleviates the responsibility of you going out and preaching the gospel. You don't need to care that much about these other people if you say, well, if they really believe, then you know, if they're just calling on God, then they're going to be saved. It's not the way it works, my friends. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to turn to Romans 10 next, but I want to read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I have planted, verse number 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's two different workers, right? This guy's planting, he's watering, we're doing all this work for God. God's the one giving the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Like I said, God gets the glory. God's the one that brings the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Sound familiar from what we've already read? For we are laborers together with God. We are workers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We are, our job is to work together. Look, these plants, the harvest isn't going to come without people planting, without people watering. God gives the increase. He gets the glory. But if, with no planting, there's going to be no fruit. Nothing's going to come of that. With no watering, it's not going to grow. God will provide the increase, but he can't provide an increase if there's nothing planted. We need to bring the word of God. We need to bring that seed of the word of God. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Nobody gets saved without someone preaching the gospel. Romans chapter 10, very, again, very famous passage in Scripture. This literally explains how people get saved. Romans chapter 10 is very simple, very simple formula. But it'll show you the importance of, of where we fit into this equation as, believe, as we've already believed. We're already saved. Where do we fit in? Romans chapter 10, look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen, I'm saved. I call on the name of the Lord. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Did you? Amen. Praise God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at verse number 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Can't call on God without believing on him. I mean, you could, you could, you could call, but you're calling on someone else. You have to believe. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How can you believe something you've never heard before? It boggles my mind. I mean, there's no way you can believe it. So the person in Africa who's never heard about Jesus, never heard about his sacrifice for your sins, how can you believe that? That's what you need to believe to be saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How can you believe on someone you've never heard of? 
You can't. You don't know what you don't know. You can't believe something you've never heard. How shall they believe on him who have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Again, there's that word preach. Preacher. A preacher is a person who goes out and preaches. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, one real quick point here was in my notes. He's talking about the feet. Why is he talking about the feet? Because your feet bring you places. Feet are used. That's why we don't treat church service as the place where people get saved. We do not gear our church services towards the lost. Church services are geared towards the believers. They're here for edification, for teaching, for learning, for everything, for, for you to become perfected. So that we can go out with our feet and preach the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We don't have them bring, you know, we don't give it to them here in Cater in church. We bring it to them. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I have saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And again, it's real interesting. They're obeying the gospel. Some people want to throw works into that. See, you have to obey. Well, <laughs> if you read the rest of that verse, but they have not obeyed the gospel. For as I have saith, Lord, who hath believed? Our report. Obeying the gospel is believing it. Obeying the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. When you obey that, you're putting your faith and trust in that for your salvation. That's all it means. Don't get confused about the word obey because it's defined for you in the rest of that verse. Verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, in hearing by the word of God. Not only, not only does a person need to hear in order to believe, not only does someone need a preacher to preach to them so that they could hear and believe, but the preacher needs to use the word of God. The Bible, God's words the seed is the word of God, as Jesus explained in his parable. The sower goeth the sow. And what does he sow? The word of God. Don't think that you're going to be saving people through your own words. You can help people to understand. You can give an analogy. You can help people to get it straight in their minds. But what brings life? The word of God. What brings life? Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ is the Word of God? Just as much as you need Jesus Christ for your salvation, and you do, you need the Word of God for your salvation. And that's why we take such a strong stand on knowing and believing and using the Word of God and not a perversion of the Word of God, not a corruption of the Word of God. We use the incorruptible seed. Not the corruptible, but come next week and we'll, we'll teach you a little bit more about that. Verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, yes, verily, their sound, not their literature, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. How did they do that? They went out with their feet, like the Apostle Paul, who, who, who traveled all over the place preaching the gospel. Verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation I will anger you. But his eyes is very bold and saith, look at this. Catch this now. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. See, but I don't think people are going to want to hear it. You need to be found of them that don't seek you. That means we're going to everybody. Oh, but we should just wait till they come here and then they actually want to hear it. You ever be like, why don't you preach to someone who wants to hear it? Because I'm going to be found of them that aren't seeking me. Because you know what? People don't even realize it. They may not be seeking. But when you knock on their door and they're willing to listen, people get saved. Because God's word is power.
The gospel has power. People might not even realize they need a savior until you show up at their door and you preach them the gospel. And you warn them and you give them the truth. They realize their condition and they put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. It works. It's the method that God has given to us. And it's the method that we're going to use today. I don't care how many years after the, the Jesus Christ was on this earth. It's still the same. God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. And his methods don't change. We're not going to improve on the way that God told us to do things. We're going to continue to go out two and two as Jesus sent his disciples unto every house and unto every person. We're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're almost done. This the last place I'll have you turn. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We don't want to be lazy Christians. Don't keep the best gift you've ever received all to yourself. I mean, think about that. The best gift you could ever receive. Hey, God saved my soul from an eternity of hell. That's awesome. And I didn't have to even do anything for it. Just receive it. Thank you, God. How much do you appreciate that gift? You're not willing to tell anyone else about it? Well, I got this gift and I'm just going to keep it to myself. No, I don't want anyone to know about it. Do you really appreciate that gift? Because here's the thing. You don't have to lose your gift in order to tell other people about it because it's available to everybody. What if you found out there's some big brand going out of business and you know what? They're going to give a million dollars to everybody that just shows up there. Would you be telling all your friends about that? Hey, guess what? Go down to Walmart. They're going out of business and all the money that they've made, they've, they've repented from their evil ways and they're just going to give everything away and everyone that shows up is going to get a million dollars. Would you tell everybody that you know to go down to Walmart and get that reward? How much better is salvation than a million dollars. I mean, really. It's a joke. A million dollars is nothing. Right. Nothing compared to the gift of salvation. But are you willing to tell all your friends about that? Don't let this world and Satan scare you into thinking religion's taboo. Don't let this world scare you into not loving your friends and family by not telling them about Christ. Oh, they might get mad at me. Oh, that might damage my relationship. Are you willing to potentially damage your relationship by bringing up something uncomfortable because you love that person? I am. I hope you are too. Matthew 9, 37, the Bible reads, Then said the end of his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. It's work. Don't get me wrong, it's work. You go out and preach the gospel, you're spending time. It's not even just like a regular walk. When you, when you preach, it's spiritually draining. It'll make you tired. It's work. But let's not be afraid of work. Let's do it. Let's do something for God. Hey, if you're going to build anything, and I don't care, this is true as a day is long in this world, you can see it. If you want to build anything, if you want to accomplish anything in your life that's worth accomplishing, there's work involved. You want a marriage that lasts? There's work involved. You want kids that are going to live righteously? There's work involved. You want to build a business? There's work involved. You want to build anything in this world? There's work. You want to turn the world upside down as the disciples did in Jesus' day? work but it could be done God's just as powerful now as he was back then and he's just waiting the only you know who restricts God we do right. our lack of faith our lack of willingness to serve and to labor for him 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 so last last passage we'll look at this morning look at verse number 1 therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. See, when we're bringing the gospel, we're not handling the word of God deceitfully. There's a lot of cults out there like the Jehovah's false witnesses and the Mormons that will use God's word deceitfully 
They love to pull verses just out of context and try to tell you that we're, you're, you're saved by your salvation. Look, we ought not to do that. And you know what? Even if you're, and I'll say this, even if what you're saying is right, don't yank a verse out of context in order to make it fit your belief. Even if what you're saying is right, don't do that because you're going to be as someone that deceives. There's look, if what you believe is true, there's plenty of clear scriptures. You don't have to go yanking other verses out of context in order to prove a point at all. That's only going to give you a bad testimony. We ought to handle the Word of God truthfully in honesty and sincerity because you shouldn't have to preach some other agenda that's not found in this book. We preach what this book says. <clears throat> Verse number three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You're still saved. I mean, you got the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're saved. But you know what? If it's hid, if you don't share it with anybody else, get, you know who you're hurting? You're hurting those that are lost. People who don't know the gospel, you'd... you'd I don't want to say you're sending them to hell, but you're not giving them the opportunity to get saved. And God will hold you responsible for not, for not preaching the gospel. Verse number four, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Again, the power, the light comes from Christ. It comes from his word. It comes from sharing that truth. It comes from the gospel. That's the light. There's a dark world out there. People are deceived by Satan. Lost are deceived. We need to give them the truth so they can break that barrier and, and have that light shine into their heart and get saved. Verse number five, for we preach not ourselves. Oh, the last thing we preach is ourselves. Believe me. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Do you view yourself as a servant for other people? We should. That's the attitude we ought to have. That's, that's Christ's attitude. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. When Jesus Christ came, he didn't have his disciples just serving him and just, okay, now you go do this and, and you bring me this. He didn't do that one time. Verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're in this weak earthen vessel. We're in this flesh. We're far from perfect. And you know what? All that does is that when we lead someone to Christ in, in, in our corrupted mortal bodies, that just means God gets the glory. Because if someone could get saved even through the foolishness of preaching, even through you know, uh, our weak selves, that's the power of God right there. Power of God wins souls. Jump down to verse number 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. He said, because I believe this, I speak it. If you're not speaking it, all I have to ask is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? And you don't have to convince me. Convince yourself. Do you believe it? Look, there's a time in my own life. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I called on the name of the Lord, and I received eternal life. And I was a child of God. And I am a child of God. And I, that happened when I was 20. And for many years, I was not doing what was right. And I was doing things that I knew were Sins and, and bad sins, okay? I'm not going to list them off for you, but trust me, it wasn't a good life. I ended up having to ask myself, do I believe these things? I wasn't talking about Jesus. I knew what the Bible said about, you know, getting drunk and, you know, fornicating and all this other stuff. Do I even believe this? No, I did. I sure wasn't acting like it. It didn't benefit anybody else that I got eternal life for many years until I got in a church like this and was sent. You know what? I wasn't going out and preaching the gospel to anyone. Why? Because I wasn't sent like Romans 10 says. <clears throat> we also believe and therefore speak, verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. 
So again, that servant's attitude. All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It's work. It's labor. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you. There's work involved. There's sacrifice involved. You have to give of your time, you have to give of yourself. You may get tired, you may get thirsty, you may get weary. But the the inner man, we could be renewed and we could gain strength to keep going. There's been many times when when you know, I haven't been feeling very well. I didn't get much sleep. It's almost every Sunday I didn't get much sleep. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. But you know what? I, and I'm just, and again, you know, I bring up myself as examples a lot because that's what I know. I mean, I know myself better than anybody else. And I don't say these things. I hope you realize this. It's not to lift myself up in any way, shape, or form because God is the one, and, and I'm amazed week after week that God is able to strengthen me to do the things that I didn't think that I'd be able to do. God has taken me. Okay, do you know what I do besides pastoring this church? Because I'm not supported by this church at all financially. I work as a computer programmer. Now, does anyone here know computer people? Do you, do you know very many computer people that are just like willing to stand up behind a pulpit and preach to a crowd of people? Because I don't. And that's not how I've been ever. The first time I ever stood up and said anything in front of a crowd of people was at a political rally. And it was something that moved me so much that I felt like I had to do it. And I literally had pains in my stomach, like, like really sharp pains. And I had to book straight home after that and just laid in bed for like an hour because of the physical pains I was receiving from, from, having, from getting up in front of a group of people. I barely passed speech class in high school. We were told not to write anything out. I wrote everything out word for word what I was going to say because I couldn't do it any other way. Scared to death. Never wanted to be the, the center of attention. Okay, and look, and I say all these things because I didn't just gain the power on my own self and my own will to, to be able to stand up and look what I've accomplished. I wouldn't do any of it without the Lord strengthening me and changing me and helping me through this at all. And look, the reason I say this is because if you are like that today, God can transform you by the renewing of your mind. Just, just You have to put forth an effort, though. See, the change doesn't come comfortably, but you have to be willing to decide and make that decision in your mind. This is important. God expects me to do this. People are going to hell if I don't open up my mouth. I need to do this. I love God. I love people. I am going to do what is in my power to do. Start with coming along as a silent partner. Start there. Okay? It'll be a little uncomfortable. You'll get past that. The experience helps you, and God will pray to God for boldness. The Apostle Paul prayed to God for boldness while he was sitting in prison for preaching the gospel, right? I mean, the guy, he's like, how could the Apostle Paul need boldness? He was being whipped and beaten and thrown into prison. He was bold. Yeah, but he still prayed for boldness. We all need it because there's the pressures of this world and the fears will come at you. But we can overcome that with the strength of God. We've got a big day coming up next week. We've got soul winning time. We've got soul winning this afternoon. We've got soul winning on Wednesday. We've got soul winning on Saturday. I'm giving you the options. If none of those times work out for you, contact me and I will make it a point to change my schedule to fit your needs to help you learn to go out and preach the gospel to other people. I will do that for you. But let me know. You need to take the initiative to do that. You have to. I will offer up as much help as I physically can for you. Don't waste it. Not everyone's willing to do that. Recognize what you have and use it and, and do some work for the Lord. That's what we're about. We're not a social club here. We're here to do some work for God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the clear teaching out of the Scripture. God, I thank you for all, all the people that are here this morning that love you, that want to serve you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to overcome the obstacles in our own path. Dear God, help us to overcome our own nervousness, our own shyness, uh, whatever the reasons are that would be preventing anybody in this room from preaching the gospel, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to understand and really realize the burden that, that, that we have upon us as far as preaching the gospel. Now, it's not a heavy burden. Jesus Christ said that his yoke is light. It isn't as difficult as we think it is. We have a tendency to make things more difficult than they really are, Lord. Help us to, to get past our own shortcomings, dear Lord. Strengthen our spirit. God, I pray that you would give a spirit of boldness on everyone here this morning. God, help us all to, to become more bold and decide we're going to do this. We're going to preach the gospel. We can't force people to get saved, dear Lord, but through your power and your spirit, some people will get saved. And we just pray that you would please use our church, help us to, to get people saved, and then to continue to disciple them, get them baptized, get them in church, and get them out preaching the gospel so that we could multiply and reach as many people as possible, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.